Today's headline is, Scientists as daredevil explorers, men who have penetrated the uttermost parts of the earth, facing untold perils for the advancement of science. It says, it is at this time of the year that those swashbucklers of science, the men who in her name penetrate to the remotest corners of the earth and wrest secrets from the unknown, are at their busiest. It is then that the explorers of the government departments are in the field, penetrating to the far interior of frozen Alaska, scaling the highest mounds of the continent, delving into the unknown corners of the deserts of the southwest. In accomplishing these tasks, they are meeting such emergencies as have turned back the adventurous amateur who has gone before them and failed. They have outstripped the adventurous spirits of the West, who have let their bones to bleach on the trail that lead towards these accomplishments. The unathletic scientist has shown himself the prince of explorers, and he holds that there is a reason. The scientific theory of adventure is this. For the wise, it does not exist. The only man who has an adventure is a man who does not know. A scientific man, starting out to accomplish a given end, sees every emergency that's possible for him to encounter, prepares for it, and then meets it. It's impossible to surprise him. Therefore, an adventure never comes his way. There's no risk, no chance of disaster, theoretically. Learning Alaska's Secrets There's Alaska, the inhospitable, for instance. The men of the government's geological survey went into Alaska ahead of the prospector. When the gold seekers came later, there was the mark of the government surveyor as a location basis. When great deposits of gold or coal were found, there was a report from a geological survey man which told all about it. When the Cunningham claims came into prominence, the geological survey had all the information with reference to outcroppings around Carbon Mount. It knows the streams that lead to the Great Interior and what is at their headwaters. It knows the passes that must be mushed in getting from stream to stream that will float supplies. Its men of science had discovered these secrets in their summer trips to this new land. Had men other than scientists passed through the experiences of these men, there would have been romance and despair in the work. But in this case, a knowledge of the difficulties had discounted the adventure. But here are some of the experiences of the individual men. A. H. Brooks, geologist in charge of the Alaskan work, knows more about that territory than any man living. He it was who took the first expedition into Alaska, studied its geology, mapped its mountain ranges, and reported upon its mineral resources. He it is upon whom Congress or any of the government departments call when they want to know the facts with relation to things Alaskan. Mr. Brooks is a scientist, a geologist, wears spectacles, has long hair, does not believe in adventure. One day in the Alaskan wilds, Mr. Brooks gave directions for the moving of camp. His directions were misunderstood. He spent the day in exploring, and at night reported at the point where he had ordered the camp made. It was not there. He could see no signal smoke. No answer came to signal shots from his pistol. There was nothing to eat and no blankets upon which to sleep. He spent the night alone in the solitude, and the next day took his back trail to the old camp. From there he followed the trail of the party into the camp where it awaited him. Yet the two days in the solitude, with his life dependent upon his ability to follow so small a thing as a trail made by a single man, were not considered an adventure. The possibility of exploring such a region as Alaska depends upon the ability to carry provisions. It would require many mules to pack the provisions that may be conveyed in a single small boat. The streams, therefore, are the highways to the interior. Mr. Brooks was once guiding a boat up one of these streams while his partner pulled it from the bank. Under this arrangement, when the boat strikes the bottom, the man in it always jumps out to lighten it that it may float free. On one such occasion, when the boat struck the bottom, Brooks jumped out, but instead of leaping into shallow water as he had expected, he jumped into a deep channel alongside the boat. He was carried a long distance down the stream by the current, but finally scrambled ashore and overtook his partner, who was tugging away at the boat, unmindful of the things that had happened to Brooks. Geologist Elliot Blackwelder was another man in the geological survey who has penetrated to interior Alaska. A trip up the Ausik River is one of the accomplishments to the credit of his party. The stream is swift and shallow. Sometimes they pulled, and at others dragged the boat from the bank. High up the stream, a series of rapids was encountered, with the snout of a glacier on one side and a precipitous mound on the other. The stream was too swift for pulling and too deep for wading. It became necessary to carry the supplies along the foot of the mound and deposit them at the head of the rapids. On one trip, as the party crept along the foot of the precipice, the rumble of an avalanche was heard from above. The melting snows had softened the mountainside, and the voices of the packers had jarred loose an overhanging rock, which started the landslide. 
It bore directly down upon them. They cowered beneath an overhanging rock, and thousands of tons of earth passed over them. The boat was demolished, but no member of the party was injured. Mixing it with mountain goat. The experiences of the wild are often strange and unprecedented, but Thomas G. Gurdin holds the record of having fought the only hand-to-hand -hand duel with a mountain goat on a precipitous ledge that has ever been chronicled. Gurdin is one of the stout hearts of the geological survey, and the late 90s found him placing his mark on many a lofty mountain in many regions previously untrod by the foot of a white man. It was while exploring Copper River in 1900 that he was separated from the rest of his party and was following a narrow ledge above a stream in an attempt to find a passage around the mountain front. It was out on a narrow ledge that he met the goat. The animal had probably never seen a man before and as a consequence was not afraid of him. Gurdin was indisposed to give up the ledge and the goat showed equal determination. Gurdin was armed with a small hatchet and the goat was armed with the effective frontispiece which is worn by all his kind. The goat charged Gurdin, who sidestepped and attempted to use the hatchet. This process was repeated several times, without much damage being done on either side. Finally, in the passage at arms, Gurdin emitted a great shout, whether of fright or exultation, it is not stated. The sound so frightened the goat that it jumped over the cliff and left the mountain side of the explorer. Robert H. Chapman is a slender, rather delicate and unathletic appearing sort of man. Yet to him is due the credit of wrestling many of its secrets from that land of tragedy of the explorer, Death Valley in California. Here the great stretches of burning sand, extending for hundreds of miles, with no water to quench the thirst of the men who would cross them. It is in the making of just such trips as are here necessary that the scientific mind has its particular advantage over that of the prospector. The scientist knows exactly how far he can travel in a given amount of food and water, so with a given distance to travel, he knows exactly how much food and water to take along. Ten pounds extra weight make it impossible for him to cross a given desert. A shortage of one drink of water might make the same accomplishment impossible. The scientist also refuses to make a farther trip into such a region as this than he can retrace with his given water supply. Meeting the First Demon There is a section of Death Valley that boasts in its area of 950 square miles, but a single watering place, known as Mormon Well. Another section, including the Sheep Range of Mounds, has only the flow of Corn Creek, which runs a few miles and then sinks into the sand. It was from this latter point that a surveying party under Mr. Chapman set out to triangulate the country from the top of Sheep Range, 9,000 feet above the sea. It developed that in one particular, this party was not truly scientific. When it was five miles from the camp, it was discovered that one of the canteens had been left behind, and this threw the reckoning of water supply versus the distance to be traveled somewhat out of balance. The journey was continued, however, as it was not regarded as a dangerous one, but when the top of the peak chosen for the triangulation was reached, it was found that a sister mound was of still greater elevation, and it was necessary to climb to its top to secure the observations desired. All this required more time, and the short water supply bred danger. Night came on before the return to camp could be made, and it was necessary to sleep on the mountaintop. The next morning, the party set out with its eyes on the green treetops of Corn Creek and their riders. Suffering greatly, the men staggered on toward camp, resisting the impulse to grovel in the sands of the roadside, which always overtakes the man suffering from thirst. But for the fact that a rescue party from camp appeared with canteens of water, the violation of the scientific principle of exploration would have meant death to this government party. Quite different from this experience was the one which Mr. Chapman passed through in the exploration of what is now the Glacier National Park in Montana. He was far up on the Swan Range, following a goat trail which was rough and dangerous. He had dismounted and was leading his horse when the animal stumbled, knocked him down, and fell upon him in the narrow trail, which skirted the edge of the cliff. The surveyor realized the great danger which faced him as he lay under his fallen horse. Were that horse to flounder and fall over the cliff, there was danger of the man being carried with him. Were he in any way to disable the rider, the solitude afforded no hope of rescue. But fortunately, as the horse attempted to rise, the man struggled free from him. Then the horse slid over the cliff and fell a precipitous 500 feet before striking the earth. The surveyor states that as the animal fell, he uttered a shriek that was almost human in his tragic fright. Nowhere in the United States does the primal condition of lawlessness exist as it does in the Big Bend of the Rio Grande River in Texas. 
Here's a stretch of land of such an extent and of such scattered population that an eastern state might be dropped into it without the knowledge of any of its inhabitants. There's a cattle ranch once in a hundred miles, a quicksilver mine at Terlingua, an occasional visit of rangers in pursuit of a cattle thief, and a well-covered trail or two over which smugglers occasionally introduce tobacco and Chinamen from Mexico. Otherwise, the country is left alone with its great solitude and the mournful howl of the benighted coyote. It was into this region that Arthur Stiles, representing the Geological Survey, went for the purpose of making maps. His experiences were novel from the standpoint of the roll-up desk of the Morris chair. For instance, in the spirit of the explorer seeking knowledge, he once allowed himself to be let down on a rope into a cave he had discovered. Such caves have been known to yield the mummified remains of prehistoric dwellers in this region, and Stiles was in search of mummies. Before reaching the bottom, he by chance dislodged a rock which fell into the cave. The result of its falling was the hissing of a veritable multitude of rattlesnakes which inhabited the chamber below. Stiles signaled to his assistants above to haul him up and escape the fate that would have been his but for the incidental falling of the stone. Exploring Tiburon One of the best examples of the superiority of the scientific explorer over the mere adventure is to be found in the case of Dr. W.J. McGee, government geologist, ethnologist, and soil expert in his trip to Tiburon Island in the Gulf of California. Upon this island dwell the Surrey Indians, the most isolated and primitive people in the world today. These Indians are of gigantic stature and fanatically believe that the touch of any man from the outside world is damnation to them. They therefore resist to the death any expedition that is sent into their country. Sixty miles of desert and a stretch of exceedingly rough water separate them from inhabited Mexico, of which they are supposed to be a part. Any invader of their island is forced to surmount these difficulties which nature places in the way before they can be intruded upon. For 300 years, they have successfully resisted all attempts on the part of the Mexican government to subdue them. Scores of parties of adventurers and prospectors, led in by the tales of a wealth of precious metals in Saraland, have attempted to explore Tiburon, and in practically every case, up to the time of the McGee expedition, the attempt had resulted in tragedy and often in the extermination of the members of the party. But Dr. McGee arranged his trip upon the principles of the scientific explorer. He knew the amount of supplies necessary to take his party across a 60-mile desert and guarantee their return. He knew the necessary materials with which to build a craft that would make it possible for his party to cross the Tiburon. He knew the strength of a party equipped with modern firearms that would be required to beat off any attack of the natives. He met every one of these requirements on the scientific basis the occasion demanded. As a result, the trip was made without any especial risk. When Tiburon was reached, Dr. McGee kept his fighting men together in such force as to discourage any attack from the natives who knew the danger of firearms. The entire expedition, which had proved depth to many adventures, was in this way made entirely safe through the man of science. So were the men of the test tube and the spectacles robbing the adventurer of the glory of their many accomplishments in the face of danger and death. So is it being demonstrated that adventure is a thing that comes only to the amateur and is due to a lack of knowledge and precaution. So were the great feats in exploration and discovery now being made by the men of science rather than the lover of adventure. The season is now on when the stunts are being done. Autumn this year, as in other years, promises additions to the store of knowledge because these men of science have gone afield in the summer months. This article was written by W. H. Dupuy. This story comes from the great state of Montana, being reported in the Anaconda Standard of October 22, 1911. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to continue to uncover all of America's lost and forgotten history, then remember before you leave to hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and remember to like and comment below. And we will see you next time on Americana Archives.